when we started the company 20 years ago, um, it, the question was, how do we deal with errors? And, and everyone kind of vaguely knows, yeah, we have to do some error checking here and there, but we, we kind of needed a rigorous approach. What do we, what do, we do? How, what do we teach to our developers? How should they deal with errors? And this is what, we, um, what I want to show you today. So the problem is clear. Errors can happen anywhere. Um, and, and we all want a reliable program. And in, in case of ThinkCell, in, it's, it's running on top of PowerPoint. So PowerPoint is terribly buggy. And then you have other add-ins running also inside of PowerPoint. They run in the same address space. So they're kind of like, you have to get along with them. And uh, so that all creates a very good breeding ground for all kinds of obscure bugs that occur. And, and that's why I think we, we know, we understand something about, about how to make this kind of setup reliable. Uh, and of course, no one has time to write error handling code, right? I mean, we have to be productive. We cannot just waste our time writing error handling code. So the question is, what do we do? Before we get to that, uh, let's go back a little bit to the basics. Um, how can errors occur in the program? How are, they, how are they coming out of stuff that you do in the program? So you say uh, you have a file here, and, and that file just doesn't exist. You want to open it for reading. Um, so how can, can you know that that file is not there? Well, the classic way is probably a return value. So you call a function, some return value comes back that says, mm, it's no good. Um, of course, that doesn't work for constructors in C++. So we can, for example, use out parameters. Well, that's not terribly pretty. Um, both these things have a, the problem as well that they clutter the code with checks. You have to put checks everywhere. Um, now, at least for return values, you can now teach the compiler to warn you if you didn't check by marking them with no discard in uh, C++ 20, I think it is. Now, another thing that, or another approach um, to get errors, yes? Can we first turn off the lights? Oh, yes. Ah, no, no the, he says we cannot turn off the lights. Uh, but, meh, yeah, I understand. That's not great. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Um, so tell me if you can't read something. <laughs> um, so I think we were here. Um, one way you can also get errors out of a call is kind of with a status flag. Um, that's not so widely used, um, but the good thing is that you have a single control path. So you are, you're doing your calls, and as long as you are not interested in the immediate result, um, for example, when you write to a file, then you may want to just execute all the calls first, and at the end, you ask, was everything OK that I did so far? Um, of course, for writing, that's fine. For reading, where you need an intermediate result, well, that doesn't work so well. One place where this is also being used is for graphics cards. So when you're making graphics output, you write your whole frame to the graphics card. And at the very end, you, say, you, you ask, well, the, was, was everything OK? And it's quite common for graphics cards that it's, it's not OK, because some other program interrupted, and, and your, your frame got lost, and you have to start again. Um, it is the default setting for C++ I.O. streams. I know that the C++ I.O. streams are not that popular anymore. We now have STID format, which is a whole lot better. Um, but so be it. Um, for C++ I.O. streams, they did have this, this um, error reporting via a status flag. One advantage of that, that uh, status flag is that you have a single control path. And there's another way to report errors um, with monads that has that same advantage, that also tries to use the same code path for the error case and for the, uh, and for the regular case, for the, for the everything works case. And it, a monad is a little bit like a variant um, of the actual result and some error code. And, and you, you, this, the, the, the operation creates that variant, and you pass that variant through the program, and it basically at every point you're, you're only doing something if, if it actually the variant contains a result and the error you will just pass through. That's the idea. And so you have a single code path where at the end you either get the, the processed result, it has, may have been processed five times and this monad always gets, gets rewrapped, and, um, or you, at the end you have an error result and then you can check that at, the, at this one place. Um, C++23 is going to have a facility like that, STID expected. It made its way through the standard. Um, so on CPP reference you can, you can look it up, it's, it's there. 
I'm not sure what the compilers, how, how much is already implemented, um, but it, it'll surely come. Now, and there is, of course, the classical way to report errors, which are exceptions. Um, now, of course, everyone knows exceptions. Um, still, I want to say a few things about them. When in C++, always catch them by reference. If you catch them by value, you may have two different problems. Uh, one is slicing. So if you have a derived class and you, you then catch the, the base class, all the derived stuff gets sliced off, you end up with a base class, which is probably not what you want. And uh, that also causes a copy, right? So you create your exception object and you copy it. And that copying may cause another exception. And, and then you have a double exception and then the terminate gets called uh, and your program terminates. So that's probably also not what you want. So remember, um, always catch them by reference. Now, what I found interesting, uh, which I didn't know for a long time, is if you write throw semicolon, that rethrows the exception. And actually, it's the original exception. So even if you copy it, the throw semicolon will throw the original exception, not the one that you copied. Just a little side note. But you'd be catching them by reference anyway, so it doesn't matter. Now, exceptions do have their own set of problems. Um, they work a little bit like a multi-level go-to returns. So they create new code paths in your, in your code. And um, that's, why, that's actually one reason why in co certain code bases they say don't use exceptions. Um, so here I have a little toy example um, where um, the, the increment will actually throw an exception if i is 3. And, um, then that exception will get caught um, in, in main. And if you, if you can be kind of mean, you could rewrite that with, with go-tos, right? And, and everyone says, oh my god, go-tos are so bad. But exceptions are not real or really a whole lot better. So it, this is how it would look like. You have an increment. And if i is 3, you have this secret out parameter, right? That's, that's kind of telling you something about the exception that got thrown. And then you set it, and, and you go to, to your exception code path. And you kind of silently leave your function. Um, and then back in main, where you catch it, it's the same thing in, in, in increment. You, you don't really see that it's happening, but really when an exception gets, gets thrown out of the increment, it's, it jumps to, to your, your catch handler. Um, and that does create many, many code paths in the program. And um, you, you have to make sure that they all work. Otherwise, it's a problem. And then we are back to square one. Uh, we don't want to write error handlers, and then our program gets so complicated, and we really have to write all this error handling, and we don't really want to do it. Of course, stop whining. We must write exception-safe code. Okay, that's what the, t the, the textbook tells you. Write exception-safe code. All right. What's exception safety? Um, exception safety is, is, is really like, it, it's not really exception-specific. It's, it's, it's error safety. And it's part of the function specification. So when you're writing a function, you have to basically think about, OK, what are the post conditions that that function is going to give me? Um, the best, in, in the best case, this function never fails. Um, th that's, that's really nice. Um, it's just hard to achieve many times. Um, the next best thing we can have is a strong exception guarantee. Um, what that means is that the function may fail, but or the, pro, the the function yeah the function may fail, but will restore the program state to whatever it was before you made the call. That's certainly possible and desirable for library functions. So the std library has that property. So when some something fails, it will restore the state to what it was before. And and if you're writing a library, if we write our library, certainly that's something that you want. Now, if you do this in application code, it's very very hard because. Usually, in, in application code, you have a sequence of many, many state changes. And one builds on top of the other. And then if at the last state change, you find out, oh, something went wrong, you essentially have to roll back all these state changes. And that's a lot of effort. You have to store all these, these transactions somehow. And then you have to be able to roll them back. So again, you are in this land of I'm writing a lot of code, making a lot of effort in order to, to, get, to get to my, my error safety. And um, you can also, maybe you want to do it in databases, but in, in our application code, that's probably not how we want to program. There's something, something a little bit weaker. That's the basic exception guarantee. And that's probably easier to achieve. You can fail. Um, but on failure, you are only required to restore the program state to something that is 
valid, where your program can continue to run. So let's say uh, we are at Microsoft support and someone calls us, hello, is Microsoft, uh, this is, is this Word support? I'm writing a book and suddenly it got all deleted. And Microsoft then says, yep, that's okay because Word only provides the basic exception guarantee. And then the customer is happy and says, oh, it's a good explanation, thank you very much. Probably you're never going to get this conversation, right? So this basic exception guarantee doesn't buy you a whole lot in practice. So again, here's the challenge. Error handling is a lot of effort. In development, we have to be paranoid. We have to check everything and we have to write handlers for all that stuff. And then we create many, many code paths. And then in testing, we tell our testers, oh, we have to test all these code paths and they are busy testing. And, 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 and if you, you know, if you don't test the code paths, they don't work. And then after we did all that, there's very little customer gain. I mean, we don't get paid for writing error handling code. So the question is, what do we do? Here's what we do. I think so, at least. First of all, we check everything. You check every single API call you make. Um, they're, they're different, usually they're by platform, there are different ways that an API can fail. Uh, Windows, you have get last error, it returns false and get last error, and then you have H result for com calls. On Unix, you have Erno that's being set. So you kind of have different facilities that check all these errors. Now, the assertions that we write into a code, they all stay in the code, even if, if it gets shipped. So they get checked on the customer side. So again there, we want to check as much as possible. The functions we mark no except if they're not expected to throw exceptions. The thinking is, again, if you don't test the code path, then probably it won't work. So if we don't expect this function to throw, just to say, oh yeah, the exception's gonna fly through my program and I hope for the best, is, is dicey, right? So that, that's not something that I want to plan, that, that I want to plan with. Um, so I'm just gonna give up. I'm just gonna say, well, it, I mark it no except, and then the terminate gets called if an exception is throwing out of the function unexpectedly. Now, that's, I think that in practice that's not so bad because things will go wrong anyway if an unexpected exception will, will, be, will be thrown. The advantage is that you can install a handler set with, uh, with set terminate, you can install a handler where you can actually do some debugging. You again can check whether this, this, this condition actually occurred. You can provide some information about it. So we check everything. And after we checked everything, and we know when things fail, we assume that everything works. Now, the question is, of course, what do you do when things don't work? The, the goal here is you keep the set of, pro, uh, of, of code paths small. By assuming that everything works, we don't have to write any, all these error handling code. Um, we, we don't have to create all these code paths. We don't have an explosion in the number of program states because every time something doesn't work, the state of the program has to kind of accommodate that. It needs to, it needs to possibly remember that things didn't work. So we don't have any of that. That's why we say everything works. But sometimes things don't work. So what do you do if things don't work? Priority number one is not to make the program somehow work. It's to collect information. When something goes wrong, you want to know, especially if it's not on, in, your, in your testing environment, if it's out on the customer side, you want to know what went wrong. How can I fix it? So you collect as much information as possible. Um, for if you are out on a, on a client machine, then we send a report home with, uh, with a memory dump. So, we, so we, we send as much information as we can um, to our server so that we understand what's going on. Now, if you are operating a server um, that's basically on your premise or on, under your control, it's much easier. Can, you can halt the thread and, and basically write someone an email, say, hey, uh, some, some thread is just hanging, attach to the thread and find out what's going on. So um, that's, that's, you, you don't have that luxury with, with client machines, unfortunately. 
My only priority too is to carry on somehow. Um, if the check was critical, then so if, if, you, if you didn't expect that check to fail, which is kind of usually the case, um, then the program behavior from now on is undefined. So you won't send further reports because something went wrong that left the program in some state that you don't 100% understand. So you're not going to go and, and send further reports and you know, make, make people crazy with something that may just be a consequence of the first check failing. As soon as something fails, you are in undefined behavior land. Um, now, if, on the other hand, if assertions fail, do try to carry on somehow. Don't terminate the program. Um, when, when we are all people, we are all humans, and humans make mistakes. And quite a few times it happens that people write assertions that are wrong. That where the program would just continue just fine, just the assertion was wrong. It happens quite frequently. So my recommendation is don't terminate on asserts, even if they fail. Just carry on. Hope for the best. Again, you are still in undefined behavior land. You didn't design for that. But quite a few times it, it will just be OK. The advantage is if you, if you carry on, people are also more encouraged to write aggressive asserts, what you want. So you want to basically tell all the developers should, be, should never be penalized for writing a wrong assert. Because you know, an assert will just strengthen your understanding about the program. And if you discourage people from writing them because you'll terminate the program or you, are, you make customers unhappy, then people won't write them. And then you won't get that extra information about your program. You will not have these, these, this, this level of security. Now, if you need actually, of course people say, oh my god, if an assertion fails, then maybe my program is undefined, and it corrupts data, and then patients die, and so on. Um, so I think if you need safety, um, then, then you have to add this at a higher level. You have to basically have a watchdog sitting there and saying, is what my program is doing, is that reasonable? Or is, is something very bad is going to happen? Um, for example, our server has, has different kinds of requests that are, that are sent to the server. And it counts the number of threads which are kind of busy with each category of request. And when a certain category exceeds a certain, a certain, a certain, count, a certain thread count, it will just stop serving that kind of requests so that you don't like, basically load up all the server with your, with your hanging program. So that's, that's something you, you add at a higher level. You, you, that's, that's not what the assertions are for. Now, what do you do next? Um, you produce, we produce the error at home. We said we collected information about the error. Now we re reproduce it, the, the error in our, in our environment, in our development environment, um, using the information. And that hopefully helps us to, to understand what's going on. Now, you only ever ha add handling code to errors that you can actually reproduce. Because if you cannot reproduce them, then they are, they are probably doing the wrong thing. You don't understand fully the error. and You don't really how know how to deal with it. Only when you reproduce the error, it's like, OK, now I have it. Then you can actually write good error handling code. Um, and on the, and, and the, again, um, you can also not test them if you cannot reproduce the error. Right? You, there's, a, there are no, there's no realistic test that, that, that will tell you whether your error handling works or not. Now, and this is basically the key part of the talk. 5% of the error handlers handle 95% of the errors. So how do you get reliable programs? It's not by handling all the errors that occur in your program. There are, there are errors caused by, by cosmic rays hitting a RAM. In, in, and you can see them. They are like errors that occur with a million people that occur once um, in, in, in years. You won't fix those. It's, it's not important. That's not going to be the big impact. You want to find out which are the ones which are frequent. And you're going to fix them and, 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 and have an error handling code for them. Now, and here it's important that these frequent errors have high quality error handling code. So we had once the case. Um, we used a Microsoft component um, to parse XML. And we had reports from the field that, that that XML component wouldn't load. And we reproduced it in our, in our lab. And, it was, um, and, and we could actually fix it by re-registering the, the, the Microsoft component with the registry. It was simply the registry was corrupt. And by re-registering the component, we could actually fix the problem. 
Now you turn that that loading XML uh, function from a yes it does fail sometimes and I have to somehow deal with it suddenly into a never fails function because whenever this thing didn't load you just re-registered your component with the registry which worked pretty much all the time and then the problem was solved and that's that's kind of the ideal error handling code you want to write these these things where the problem is fixed and you don't have to deal with that condition in the rest of the program now i want to go through categories of errors um, and because there are we, we, we over time we kind of refine that concept of what what kind of constitutes an error and, and how should you deal with it um, the the most severe one of course is a critical error the, the critical error is one where the program behavior afterwards is undefined so it's it's like things like a null pointer access uh, an API call that you expect to work, but it doesn't work, um, or an assertion that fails. So that's a, that's a critical error. You treat them like they never happen. It's, you don't write error handling code for them because by definition they never happen. If you write error handling code for an error that does happen, it's no longer a critical category. You kind of accept it, this is part of my program now. This is, this is no longer a, a, a condition that I'm relying on in my program, it's no longer a critical error. A critical error is something where you say, this, I'm not expecting this to happen. And so you don't write any handlers, and, uh, and the program state is undefined. Afterwards, you're not going to send further reports. Go ahead. Absolutely. API calls may fail. Um, the question is, which ones fail, and how often do they fail? And the vast majority, just by experience, never fail. They, they work. And then you write all these error handling code for stuff that, that, that works. Of course, there are some way you can, that, that, that will surely fail. Like when you write to a file. I mean, this can be folded, this can be broken, whatever. I mean, these things are, are easy to, to, to make, to break. I mean, I'm just going to unplug the network cable. And, and now I reproduced my error. So that's certainly an error that you have to address. And then you can't say, oh, I'm going to de deny the existence of this thing. But there are many other API calls. Uh, it's like, okay, what's the, the parent window of my window? Well, it, it's by experience, it gives you an answer all the time. Maybe, it, maybe once in a blue moon it fails, but you, know, you, have, to kind of, it, you have to decide what you're going to spend your resources on, your development resources. And, and it's not going to be on when, when get parent of a window fails, because it just doesn't fail. It's okay. Um, now, what do they do? Uh, what do you do in the case of a critical error? Um, you send a report for it when, when it's happening on a client, and as I said, you disable future reports. You don't want to hear from this guy again because it's now in often undefined behavior land. You, you don't really know what's doing anymore. Uh, with a server, you can go into an infinite loop and wait for the programmer to attach a debugger. Um, now, do you tell the user that this error happened? Well, we do it only if an if a false alarm is unlikely, when an API call fails that you don't expect to fail, we tell the user. Because we probably had a reason to do this API call. The, the, the likelihood that the program is not going to work very well if the API call fails is pretty high. Now, with an assertion that failed, as I said, maybe the assertion was wrong. So there are two subcategories, basically. One that says, I'm, I'm pretty sure that things are going to break now. And the other one is, is maybe we are going to be OK. Um, and, and only in the, I think I'm pretty sure that things break, you want to tell the user. And uh, otherwise, you're just going to create a nuisance and, and then people don't write asserts anymore. Now, um, here's another category that's, that's basically one level down. Um, that's something that's untested. You never had that, that uh, and, and, and this is the vast majority of errors that you have in your program. This is the, the, the vast majority of checking you are going to do. Um, everything else, it's, it's either that or it's completely defined behavior. So in, in, in this categorization, a uh, file got deleted, uh, a file is not there when I open it, is not, an er not considered an error. It's just normal program operation. So you don't need to report, you don't need to do anything. It's, it's just what the program should do, it's fine. Now, there are a few things which are shades of gray to, uh, of, of an actual error. Um, like a situation that you've never seen, that you've never that you that you suspect exists, um, and it's documented to exist, but you you have never seen it in actual practice. For example, um, you are hooking a function um, that registers foos, 
Okay, so you have a function that registers foos, and that's provided by someone else, and you hook it and say every, every time a foo gets registered, I want to know about it. And that register foo can fail. So someone gives you bad input. Is that easy to recreate in the lab? Yeah, it's relatively easy to recreate. You just generate a bad foo and tell register this foo, and then the register foo says, mm-mm, doesn't work. So you kind of recreated that error. But, um, but still, you've never seen it in your actual environment. PowerPoint never did this. Okay. Um, now, that would be a, a case where you may want to know about it because you don't have a reproduction for register foo failing in the actual environment that you're operating in, and you don't know what PowerPoint is going to do if this register foo fails. Right? So probably it's interesting to know about it. So we actually send an, a report home, and then we don't disable future reports, we just throttle them. So we don't get flooded. If that happens a gazillion times, you don't want to get flooded with, with error reports, and the client machine is just busy sending error reports. Um, in debug, of course, you can tell the developer because suddenly you have a now you have a reproduction um, if you're running it in your in your own in your own uh, on your own machine. Um, servers send send reports, but they don't stop. They don't halt the thread. They just keep going. Um, here's another one: bad user experience. Um, say you have a third-party bug. Um, sometimes PowerPoint makes shapes disappear, and and you know about it, you've, you've, you've tried it out, yeah, shapes disappear, uh, but you're not, it, it's rare, and you don't want to write any more elaborate code for it. Um, what we are doing is um, users may call, they may complain, and say, well, what's going on? Um, so you want to log this error. So when a user calls, you can look into her error log and see, oh, okay, this error occurred, and I can explain now why that shape disappeared, because it was that situation that I know about already. And then maybe you have to write a handling code, or you have to fix it, or you have to make PowerPoint behave, or whatever. Now, this is, a, this is an, another very weak one. Um, the, sometimes you may run into a situation that's an indication for a broken environment. So, um, for example, if you get from the operating system the information, hmm, today the default set, the decimal separator is a space. Okay, we don't write comma or decimal points, but we write spaces. It's like, well, that, that's kind of unusual. Um, but we, we play along, we, we, we support it, we, we tested it. Um, but why is it doing that? Maybe, maybe it's something else will go wrong now. Maybe it's giving me spaces because if this whole subsystem of the operating system is broken, it will just return spaces for everything. Um, so I kind of want to know about it. What we do is um, when you are in a, report, a remote support session, so if someone attached to the client computer, um, your customer computer, and says, okay, support engineer, show me what your problem is. Um, we kind of switch on a special log state that at that point, we log these kind of errors. We, uh, otherwise, we don't. But if you, want, if, you, if you know that there's something wrong with the machine, if someone calls already and says, mm, I, something is bad, you may get crashes or whatever, um, then you can s enable the special logging state, and then you get more information. And, and then these things may be like, oh, you have this, yes, your machine is crashing, but on the other hand, your, your, you know, your functions uh, for decimals places, they, they just return <coughs> spaces for all the separators. M maybe there's a connection between the two. Now, um, how do we do error analysis? Um, I always said, okay, we send a report home, right? We, we want to do some, some analysis on our server. So how does that work? Um, reports are being uh, sent to the server um, automatically, and if the user opted out, says, no, I don't want that, then they can actually send an email, um, an automatic email that contains the same information if they are interested in it solving a particular bug. We have a big database with all the dumps, with all the errors, um, and they are automatically, when they arrive, they are automatically opened in a debugger, and we automatically analyze the stack trace, and we get basically the location where that error occurred. And so we can categorize all the reports that come in by the file and the line where they occurred. Um, and, and then you basically have a, have a long list of all the errors and you can sort them by frequency. And, uh, and then the developers can go and, and open each and every dump and, and take a look inside, in, inside these dumps in a debugger and to see what's, what's wrong and try to understand the problem. Now, um, developers can also mark errors as fixed. So you can say, hmm, I, I think I fixed in a, a, a solution for this particular problem. 
and you write that version where it's fixed into the, into the database. And uh, that actually triggers automatic updates. Once that version is available, that triggers automatic updates for the customer. Um, so they, they don't even get anything. They just get an automatic, an automatic update at this point. Um, we also have this for email. So if they send us an email, we bounce an email back immediately, which is sometimes is, is cool. If people think we are like up 24 hours and, and we are very, very fast responding for, uh, to email, uh, telling them, oh, yes, I understand your problem. Uh, please update to this version. Uh, <laughs> All right, um, here's another thing I want to talk about is um, how do you, can you find out, um, very often errors are related to the environment. So it's, it's not that you made a mistake particular or made, it's, it's not something that you can reproduce in your, in, at home because you don't have that environment. There's an add-in that's installed, it's a particular graphics card, it's something that you, you, don't, you, you, you don't test for. Uh, but that's out there and that's causing trouble. So um, how can you find out? Can you, can you find out whether a particular module is responsible for the, for the error? And these, these modules get, get sent with the, error, with the error reports, with the dumps. Um, it's essentially every, all the modules that are loaded into the process. And we kind of want to know, well, which one is responsible for this particular kind of error? Um, and we a little bit of statistics can help. Now, let's say you have a report database with all the reports, and um, here I have 12 reports, mm -hmm. and one means it's this particular problem that I'm interested in, and zero means it's some other problem that where I say, well, this is basically my background distribution. This is my, I don't have that problem, and that's, that's a normal distribution of modules. And you're kind of trying to, under, to, to see the difference between the distribution of modules when the error occurs versus the distribution of modules when the error does not occur. So that, that's, that's the kind of the, the game you want to play. Um, Say so here you have a module A and that's present in some reports and a module B that's present in some reports. And module A is, is three times out of six in those reports that we are not interested in, that's, that's not the error, and three times out of six in the error reports. So likely A does not have, to do with the pro have anything to do with the problem. With module B, hmm, it's a bit more skewed. So you have four out of six which actually ha are, are, are with the error that actually is the problem you are interested in, and it's only occurring two out of six times with the reports that you're currently not interested in. So background distribution. So you could say, well, yeah, B is a bit more frequent in the error cases. Um, is, that, is, that, is, is B maybe the culprit? Hmm. Let's see. Um, how can we decide? Is that chance that it's four out of six? Or is it, is it something substantial? Now, here's the idea. Um, we use minimum description length. I mean, it thinks that we try to do everything very rigorous and very mathematical and, and correct. So we said, okay, what's the, what's the theoretical foundation of, of what we are doing here? Um, and the idea is that if some module has to do with a problem, this, then if you take all the reports that have that module and try to compress the information if this report has the problem, so you have zero, a sequence of zero and ones, and you know all of them have that particular module, then the statistics of the zero and ones should be different from the statistics where that module is not present. So the idea is I can either say, hmm, this, I can either say this module has nothing to do with the problem, and I'm just gonna disregard its presence and just gonna compress that stream of zero and ones. Or I can say, okay, the module has to do with the problem, and I, I, I use it to improve my compression. I use it to basically explain the world, explain my, my data. How do you select that? It's, uh, it's coming from our error reports. So you will get just the, 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 the users, just whenever they run into a problem and they haven't opted out, they send us a memory dump. And in the memory dump, they have the list of modules. So over time, you're collecting thousands of, of occurrences of bugs. And they all contain what kind of modules are they had. And now you can see, and, and before we kind of poked into them and, and looked at the module list and said, mm, maybe this module here appears here and let's try this one and maybe here we have it. But we want to automate that. Don't, we want to 
have a rigorous process where right when you have the list of now when you have a list of errors it tells you my best guess why this error occurs is this module and for all the errors um, sometimes there's nothing to do then you get some generic module like Excel or PowerPoint or whatever but sometimes it's quite it's standing out it's like oh it's the SAP add-in again um, so how does this work um, say you how, how do we compress, first of all? Um, we compress this stream of zero and ones uh, with arithmetic compression. And that's, um, and, and we estimate that, that we, we do the compression with the Laplacian estimator. Um, so the idea is you are estimating the probability that in this string of zero and ones you get a one or a zero. So that probability may be 50%, but it may be something else. And if it's something else, you can actually compress that stream down. It's standard compression, what you know, any any like PNG or something would do um, for for compressing data. So it's kind of a standard compression algorithm. Now, the number of bits that you need using this scheme, um, if you have n bits and k of them are ones, then it's log n plus one times n over k. And um, just to give you some numbers. Uh, the number of bits becomes smaller when p is closer to 0 or 1, as I said. So if you have 12 bits with 6 ones, then you see, need 13.5 bits. So it's more than 12 bits because, I mean, every, every compression scheme has to make some set of the data larger. Right? Some, some choices of your data are going to get larger for other choices to get smaller. So here, the, the, the 6 bits out of 12 is kind of the worst case. There you are spending 1.5 bits more than you spent previously. But if in the ideal case, if you have 12 bits with no ones at all, you get 3.7 bits. So you compressed quite a bit. Now we are doing compression. So as I said, compressing all the reports together is 13.55 bits. Okay. Now we make use of module A. The key here is we have to transmit that we use module A and not module B for our prediction. And this is kind of why we do all this stuff. Because if you are generating lots of hypotheses about what could be responsible for this bug, so it means like any modules, and there are hundreds of modules, and there are many, many different kinds of things that you could see in your, in your, in your, um, in your dumps, which may correlate with the error. But you don't really know, is that correlation chance? Or is that something substantial? And that's what we want to tell apart. And that's why we need to, need to make sure that our hypothesis is encoded in that scheme. And this is what we do here. So we choose A over B, which is one bit. And then we compress all the reports with A. That's 7.13 bits, three, three out of six ones. And then all the ones without, also 7.13. We sum it all up. We get 15.26 bits, which is more than our 13.55. So A has nothing to do with the problem. Now, if you do the same thing with module B, well, it also doesn't quite add up. So we, the four out of six still requires 6.71 bits. And if you add it, uh, add it all up, you end up with 14.43 bits. So you could say four out of six is statistically not enough to say this report, uh, this, this module really has to do with a problem. Now we go one step more. Uh, we have mod a module C, a third module. Now, since we have three modules now, we have to choose one out of three. So now it's the um, two logarithm of three bits that we need to transmit our choice. So it's 1.58 bits, right there. Um, but now the compressing is, is going to make it smaller, 5.39 bits. And if you add it all up, you end up with 12.37. So the machine would say this is actually relevant. And, and so for every choice you make, you not only get, okay, is this relevant or not, but you also get this, this difference in the number of bits as a number that says, okay, this is how relevant this actually is. As I said, if you have many more hypotheses, and we have hundreds of modules, we have version ranges, we try to find out whether it's a particular version, either up to this version or from this version, or even a version range that is responsible for the error. So we have lots of hypotheses that we all have to encode, and we all have to account for that information, um, what we picked. And, and that, makes, that, that basically avoids this problem that at some point, some random choice is going to, is, is going to win the game. Um, 
Now, this actually also works if, if modules fix the problem. So if, if it doesn't appear the, um, with, if a certain module is present, that will also show up just the same. Go ahead. From your, from your experience, how many hosts are needed for, path to, for, for this to have uh, an invisible data? It's, if, for us, the number, it, it was, this was never a problem. Because the, the, um, with, at least with, I mean, we have a million users. Um, and, and we always collect enough reports to this become statistically significant. Um, so if the, the ones where it's basically, it's more that the occurrence number is so low at some point that this is, that we just don't bother maybe looking at the bug. Um, I mean, if it's obvious, then we're still gonna fix it. But, but if it's a complicated bug that's not immediately obvious and it only occurs, you know, 30 times, then that, that's not enough. I mean, the, the, the big ones occur thousands of times. And, and, and so this was never a problem. We always collect enough data to, to make that decision, really. Um, but it, there is, of course, a, a big difference in the, in the, in the, in the gain and the number of bits um, where yeah, how confident you are that this is actually the problem. And, and they are clearly, in some situations, it just makes a random choice. And, and it's, it's, you can see them, the, the bit difference is small. So it's, it, it, that's not significant. But, but one of the things, one of the favorite ones, like you know the SAP add-in, you're going to see it's going to light up. Like. So um, yes, so that almost brings me to the end of the talk. I want to talk about one more thing, um, which are C++ 20 contracts. Um, they were a new language feature. Um, it's essentially an assert on steroids. Um, the idea is that these contracts, you, you, that you can make de declarative function pre and post conditions. You can write them down. There's a syntax for it. And, um, and, and there, there was, so the idea is you, you have more support for, for expressing these things in the language other than just writing asserts. Um, the problem actually was, um, there, there are many questions associated with it. When do you want to check the contract? Do you want to check it in debug? Do you want to check it in release? Do you want to check it at all? Or is it just pure documentation? Um, what do you do if a contract is violated? Um, do you terminate the program? Do you carry on? Do you report? What to whom? All these questions um, at the end led to it being removed from C++20 at the last moment. They, there was just no agreement. And, and I think this talk kind of shines a light on, on all these questions that arise. And um, I'm not sure where the discussion is for C++23, but I think they're not in C++23 as far as I know. Maybe for 26, let's see. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yes, we are recruiting. We are based in Berlin, but we also have uh, remote positions. So whatever you like, that's why we're doing all this. And uh, if there are any questions, go ahead. We are very aggressive. We are very aggressive with it. So whenever there's basically, we, we don't expect an exceptions to be thrown out of a function, we, we write no accept. I know that there's, there are disagreements on whether to do this or not, uh, but that's, that's our position on it. We, we write no accept, essentially every function, unless you know it's going to throw an exception in some situations. Um, um, Uh, we usually it's we have give a terminate handler. We send a report. We say okay, an, an exception occurred, um, and then and then we crash. It's we we don't usually handle the situation when unexpected exceptions get thrown. Um, it's it's just about collecting information and then and then crashing, and and hopefully you will you will you know you, you maybe you can fix it. It's one of the rare it, it's it's one of the rarer bugs. It, you, you'd be surprised that this is actually not happening very often. Um, other things are, like failed API calls are much more common. Um, so no except usually, it, it would be certainly a waste of time if we would, we would accommodate every function possibly throwing exceptions. It's, they don't, rarely. Anything that goes. Um, I, I don't have I don't have any particular 
I'm not, not religious about you know, what kind of error reporting mechanism to use. For me, this is all just you know, program logic. And sometimes exceptions are very practical um, in, in certain situations where you, you, know, you, want to, you want to abort a certain operation. We do use exceptions. Um, it's, it's totally fine. Um, I'm just saying it's not the, it's not the cure all. It's not the, oh, I'm just, if an error occurs, I'm just throwing in exceptions and some other parts of the program somehow have to deal with it. In, and, and this is like, like I'm, I'm basically always doing this, although I don't really understand why an exception is being thrown. That's what we don't do. Um, we, we use exceptions as essentially to control program flow. And if it makes sense to use them, yes, if they are thrown, they're slow, but it's still, they, they, it's, a, it's a nice way to, to bail out of a deep call stack. So then, then we use them. Um, there's really, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just another tool in the toolbox. Oh, there you go. Can you use the optional? Can you use any kind of optional return types? Is the optional? Yes, absolutely. I mean, th these are one of the things we do. I mean, that that if functions that we only if we know they fail. I mean, you know, as part of normal program operation, an optional is perfectly fine if you if you uh, to report an error. An exception is perfectly fine to report an error. A std variant with two error states and a good state is perfectly good to re report an error. I mean, whatever you know, whatever floats your boat, whatever you know is is, is practical. At, 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 in this particular situation, to, to report errors, um, it's, I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I don't have any particular strong opinion against or for one or the other way. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>